Hey everybody, thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk. We get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, that guitar icon thingy, Border City Rock Talk to your writer. My guest Stephen Bassett's gonna kick your butt, or Art Bell's gonna come back and kick your butt. You hit her pretty hard there, Rick. <laughs> 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 he hit her again. As well, please hit the notification bell, the like button, and uh, comment below. Uh, before further ado, I bring to you Mr. Steve Bassett. How are you doing, Steve? It's good to be with you, Ernest. Really is. I remember listening to you, and I got started in the genre of uh, ufology, um, listening to your uh, Art Bell show. How many times did you appear on uh, Art Show, Dreamland, and or Coast AM? I think, including Nor, and yeah, of course, George Norrie. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't been on in a while. I'd like to get back on it. Maybe thirty times. 30. I'm not sure. Have you been on with um, Richard Serrett? Yes, done oh. Richard a couple of times. I need. I'm going to be doing a lot of media. I'm going to be sending out a very serious media blast here pretty soon, and start doing a lot of interviews because there's really some major developments coming, and I want to. I want to want to promote them and and also uh, tip people off. Perfect. Yeah, I interviewed Richard not too long ago. He's a f uh, fellow Canuck as well uh, as I am. Um, so you're doing this week the um, the uh, I'm sorry. What's this weekend the con? Well, the conference season is underway. Yeah, uh, the Conscious Life in the I'm sorry, the uh, Conscious Life Expo in and uh, the LAX Hilton this year was massive, right. which told me that we're back. Not only is it, obviously we're coming out of the pandemic, we're, it's not totally done with us, but the people were there in thousands because an excitement level was high, mm -hmm. even though the UAP issue is just part of the uh, uh, the CLE. But uh, you could just tell there's a level of anticipation and expectation I've never seen before uh, in my 26 years. So that was good. And then um, there has been, I think, uh, one or two other conferences. I'm going to be involved uh, this weekend at the UFO Con at the Double Tree Hotel near the, as the San Francisco airport. Mm -hmm. This is Lorian Fenton's. That's UFOCon2023.com. Right. Still time to to come and 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 hang out. I haven't been up there in quite a while. It'll be my first event up there in five years. So I'm looking forward to meeting old friends. Uh, Double Tree Hotel, UFOCon2023.com. And then, uh, and, and you can find the upcoming conferences, which I generally keep up pretty well, mm -hmm. at my website, paradigmresearchgroup.com, okay. or just Google Stephen Bassett, it comes up, and you go to the resources upcoming conferences, and you can see the list of conferences that are, that are, that are in development. Some of them are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Church has booked the entire Luxor Hotel, the whole hotel. He's a rock star. Ancient aliens kind of theme. Thing uh, naturally, it's a luxury. I mean, again, it's hard to for those that maybe weren't really into this issue, say twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. These is, these are just inconceivable things. But the reason is that people know we're heading towards finally confirmation. We're not alone in the universe, and they're getting really excited. Anyway, yeah. a major conference coming up in June, June two to four. This is Contact in the Desert, yeah. which has a very long history, going back through Joshua Tree. Uh, it has as many as 4,000 people. Uh, I don't think it'll hit that this time because Ken, we're coming out of the pandemic, but mm -hmm. a couple thousand people are going to be there. This is an incredible resort to Renaissance uh, Indian Wells near Palm Springs. Uh, I've, I've spoken several times. It's one of the premier conferences in the country. Uh, and um, so uh, if you, you know, check that out. That is um, contactinthedesert.com. Uh, I think they're going to have 60 speakers. Wow. Uh, so uh, that's coming up. And then just one more promo, if you don't mind. Yeah, I don't I'm, mind. That I'm going to be at a conference in December, which is uh, part of a group that emerged out of Spain. And, and I can't keep up with all the groups that are emerging, right? Yeah. So they come up with this plan, that plan, this project, that initiative. There's several groups that have signed up as lobbyists. Uh, lobbying groups are, are, are turning up. Mm -hmm. But this is a World Ufology Con Congress, which has been held in Barcelona and elsewhere. But they are planning a major, major event in Mexico City in December, World Ufology Congress. And let me tell you, it is going to be huge. Why? Because the interest in Mexico yes. surpassed 
does the interest in the United States in the yeah. issue of UFO or OVNI? Yeah. Uh, because they have had huge numbers of sightings down there. So I'm excited about that. I believe this is the year. I believe the next thing we're going to uh, hear that, that confirms this is an announcement from a major committee in con Congress, probably the Senate, probably the Senate Intel, that hearings with military witnesses are going to be convened shortly, or they may even give a date. Uh, and so I have a new Twitter um, uh, hashtag that I'm pushing. Okay, let's <laughs> do it. Hashtag months, not years. And that's because in a, in a, a, a Twitter post that I put out there, I listed several articles. Uh, they were just remarkable. I'm boom, 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 boom. And Absolutely. I, uh, it's 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 because a lot of people are telling me we're years away, we're years away, and I said no, it's it's not years, it's months. We're months away, not years. So that's the new hashtag. Perfect. So this could be uh, yeah. Ernest. And uh, what can I say? It's been a long time coming. Yeah. Uh, before I get into um, my um, decades morphing in and out of things related um just want to mention um i'm diversifying this channel it was mostly for rock stars you know d snyder twisted sister mike reno lover boy but i'd like to mention tom DeLong. and what do you have to say about tom DeLong blink 182 and how much passion he has in this um genre can you say genre? tom DeLong is, is is got a place in history here there's no question his interest in the subject goes back when he was in high school yeah very smart guy Yes. And uh, it, while he was teaching himself the guitar, he was teaching himself about uh, studying the UFO issue. He got involved extensively in the early 1990s and uh, uh, then went back to music, uh, very successful, multiple yeah. bands. And then in a complex um, uh, uh, process, which he's, he's, he's alluded to and talked about a little bit, he ends up getting in, involved in meeting with a lot of people within the military intelligence complex that I like to call it. We're talking the usual entities, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And ultimately emerges as the uh, the leader and spokesperson for a group uh, called the To The Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, which included two people in particular, Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon. This, and then some very significant information was presented to the New York Times, which created spectacular front page New York Times stories. Uh, the full origin of all of that is not fully clear yet. The point is, is that those two stories in the New York Times, which some aspects of it have been challenged and are, and are being viewed by some, some skeptics and so forth, and they may find that there's some things that are not quite exactly what we thought, mm -hmm. but ultimately it won't matter. Those two stories were like a, a nail that, that popped a balloon that's been inflated for 75 years. All right. In other words, uh, 70 years, uh, 40, 70 years, uh, meaning that for 70 years, the the, 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 the number of people and the uh, awareness that the government's position on this was, in fact, not true, mm -hmm. that it was misrepresenting this reality for national security reasons has been growing and growing. And that balloon is getting tighter and bigger and tighter. And ever, efforts to pop that balloon. Uh, previous to 2017 had not succeeded. We gave it a shot. We did the best we could, but we might have weakened it a little bit. But that new, those New York Times articles popped it, and since then the stuff is the 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 interest is now moving outward rapidly, uh, slowed down by pandemic, by politics, but nevertheless. Uh, and Tom DeLonge played a role in, mm -hmm. in popping that balloon and 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 and, and helping the developments, uh, initiating developments that, that have taken place over the last five years. Now, he has he stepped back uh, and is much more to the music, though he still mm -hmm. retains uh, involvement in, in head of uh, uh, a, a reformed entity called To The Stars. Right. Uh, so we hear less about his involvement in the UFO issue, more about his music and so forth. But uh, he's a very smart guy, very successful I wouldn't be surprised if we see him back in the AET issue, UAP issue, right. in some important way very soon, more, more openly. Don't know. Uh, but his place in history, I think, is, is is established. Awesome. And so is yours, by the way, obviously. Um, over the decades, um, investigating this, reading books, uh, Avi Loeb, um, he's actually one of the speakers in, uh, I think, um, in June. Back of the desert, yeah. Is. Linda Howe and Graham Hancock. Um, over Man, the decades, I've gone 
and I've always known there's something else out there, right? You just have to, like, I mean, it's just, you, you just have to, because then you'd ask, well, who created that? Who created that? So, you know, there's something out there. I know there's something out there. Um, but my question is, it's just, a, it's a human nature question that I have. If there is something out there, how, and this is a unique part, I think I mentioned it with my interview with Richard, why haven't we had a, a picture that is so close up? We always get these pictures that are blurry. The one that was released in the New York Times last year, the video from the U.S. Air Force of uh, something that was, you know, in their peripheral that they, they targeted on with their video camera. Um, why haven't we got a clear cut picture, in your opinion? The best answer I can give to that is one, by and large, the government has had the best opportunity to get pictures mm -hmm. going back to the beginning, okay? Yeah. At Roswell, they had a whole bunch of camera guys out there taking pictures, all right? All right? Of the bodies of the crash, they had pictures taken, of course, of the autopsy, whatever. I'm sure there was that. Those are classified. We're not going to see them. Uh, we They have countless uh, films uh, uh, over the decades of the attempts to intercept, I say intercept, but certainly go up and, and intercept or deal with the intrusions from time to time where they know something's up there and they send craft up to check it out, which is their job, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and they film these encounters and they have countless uh, examples of those. But again, we don't get them. All right. The ETs have extraordinary capabilities in terms of maneuverability in terms of possibly even cloaking. Uh, and so, boom, boom. They can okay. be there and they're gone. Uh, so in the early decades, it's not like everybody's running around with a camera, right? Or eventually it was a Polaroid. And so the idea that, oh yeah, we should be getting a lot of shots. No, not exactly. They're not, they're not like mountains. You just go, go, go find one, stand in front of them and take a really great shot. No. Mm -hmm. uh, the very nature of the way they seem to maneuver uh, there seem it, it, it's kind of blurry because they the craft in some way are distorting the space around them in in, in, in a number of possible ways. Uh, so there's that. As we move forward, though, and there's more cameras, and everybody's got one, you're starting to see more now. And over the years, there have been some pretty crisp, clear photographs. Right? You go and you can find them online, but. Uh, yeah, and, and there are probably others in researchers' files that are not online. But again, under the truth embargoes protocol, if a photo is fuzzy, it's useless. And if a photo is clear, it is fake. That's the protocol. Yeah. There are no ETs, therefore there can be no photos of a real ET craft. It's either not decipherable or it's fake. And so... For a lot of people, they don't realize there have been a number of Chris photos that have been out there, but they are not elevated and they're not put on the, the, the front page of the New York Times. Those gun camera clips were. Now, understand, those three gun camera clips or three, well, basically, they're basically um, three, um, uh, call them, it's hard, clip is not quite it, because you've got cameras, you've got FLIR, which is infrared radar and so forth, but these surveillance uh, clips are what the, the government and what the Department of Defense was willing to allow out the door. Mm. Right? It's not what somebody went in and sorted through thousands of them and said, oh, here's the good stuff. And some recent analysis uh, on these, uh, particularly by Mick West, uh, who did an extraordinary analysis on the, uh, the gimbal, uh, is starting to indicate that some of the the, the way they maneuvered or were, were acting within that clip actually might have been the result of, of the, uh, the, the devices that were recording them, right? Yeah. Uh, which takes some of the mystique out, though it doesn't identify what they are. So in that case, again, we're getting what they allowed out the door. If you, I assure you, if we were allowed to go to the vaults and review any footage from intercepts, by our, our Air Force and or Navy, Air Force over the United States, Navy over the ocean, and see what they have, I have, we would see some spectacular stuff, all right? And so when you add it all together, uh, you end up with this sense that why can't we get a good photograph? Mm -hmm. and, 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 it, and that's sort of true, but if you know the full history of this, you can understand why. 
right? The, the, the whole thing, the whole truth embargo is set up so that you either can't get the photo or if you get it, it's not real. Uh, and then you classify anything that's in uh, government hands. And so the result is you have a limited amount of that out there. Um, and I and the average person is not going to understand this. They're just going to go, why yeah. is there a photograph? And I, I understand yeah. that. I appreciate that. Um, that brings me to a couple other things um, related. Well, it's all related. Um, the reason why I particularly believe there's something out there is uh, one of the first <clears throat> books I purchased about, I think I got it as a gift, it was about 18 years old. It was Richard ha uh, Hoagland's The Monuments of Mars, right? The Face on Mars. That started me off on that journey because personally, I don't think it was a trick of light or any kind of uh, weathering. But there is a Canadian former general, uh, Paul, and his name escapes me. He's one of the most high up officials that I know of that said there are definitely, um, I don't know if he used the word extraterrestrial, but he said unidentified flying objects. You know which Paul I'm talking about? You're saying he was a former general and now he's a comedian? No, no, I didn't say comedian. Canadian. Oh, Canadian. Okay. All right. Canadian. Well, we have a lot of comedians okay. here in Canada, but Paul uh, uh, Hellier, I think it's Hellier. Well, Paul Hellier was a former politician. Yeah, yeah, he was, he, he was the former defense, uh, Secretary of Defense or Minister of Defense in Canada. Yeah, thank he, you. He said that there, yes. he was told that. I have been told that by people inside the government. All right. You know, again, what does that mean? Uh, I assure you, plenty of people have been told that by people inside the government, who even when they were working, but in a way that it wasn't going to end up on the New York Times. Yeah. Right? Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's now the worst kept secret in the world. Right. At this point, it's the, simply the worst kept secret in the world. There was a time when it was a well kept secret, mm -hmm. a well kept classified matter, no question. There was a time when the government said Area 51 didn't exist at all. Yeah. Even though we, it was being seen on Google Earth, right? And, yeah. and finally, oh yeah, it does exist. Look, this whole, this whole charade, this game, this passion, this kabuki theater stuff. Look, it's part of the national security reality that emerges out of the the the, the, the creation of the atomic bombs and the the the, the to the death um, uh, uh, this, what, what am I trying to say? Political battle, ideological battle between capitalism and communism, east and west, and so it's generated this 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 aura of era that we've been in since I was born. The yeah. era of mutual assured destruction, which is, I'm sure anybody back in history would, would, would go, what? Right? You know, what? What? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah, we have our wars and everything. We, you say mutually assured destruction of what? Oh, the planet, or, or at least civilization. What? And there we are, right? The ultimate, the ultimate in, a, end game of what humans have just been addicted to since they became civilized, which is war. Yeah. We're addicted to war. Now, we've always been you know, tough. Humans survive. They kill what they have to kill, and they will kill each other. That goes back hundreds of thousands of years. Right. There were many, many strains of homo uh, that didn't make it. And I think in some cases, the, re the really reason they didn't make it is that another strain of homo killed them all off, whatever. And so, yeah, we have a, a, a violent past in a sense, like every other uh, probably mammal. And, and, and most uh, most animals of, of any type, any species. Um, but once we became civilized, we needed to leave that behind. We couldn't do it. And so for the last 12,000 years, war has been the expression of that fundamental violence, that fundamental need to survive by killing. And we just can't stop it. All we do is kill more and more and more and make weapons that could kill more and more and more. And we finally reach the ultimate, the penultimate point. Mm -hmm. where we live in an age called mutually assured destruction, which is MAD, M-A-D, one of the most appropriate acronyms ever in the English language, okay? Right. Yep. So that's what we And so the, the point is, is that the extraterrestrial presence and the, the process leading to its confirmation, disclosure, worldwide, are connected. And that's where most of my uh, lecturing is going. Uh, I'm not, I don't like to get into the granular stuff. Uh, details of like a particular analysis of this particular film and showing yeah. where the stuff. 
I don't care so much about that. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the overall public's perception and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the media engagement and ultimately the disclosure process. And so what is profound to me is when you have two substantial sections of two consecutive national um, uh, defense authorization acts in a row with huge language setting up a public facing entity within the United States Congress, which uh, people involved in this issue 25 years ago would be just completely astounded that it's happened. That's what's important. And so we're moving forward on this, but, and I'll restate it again, the emergence in the modern era of extensive ET activity and the emergence of the era of mutual assured destruction began at virtually the same time and they are interlinked uh, and disclosure is going to hopefully reveal that connection. So for the viewers that um, have been following this topic for years and 20 years ago, I guess, uh, roughly, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer um, and the panel met at the um, um, the press um they had the press release, and I think it was press one club, of the most press club. Uh, uh, yeah, press conference May not May May nine two thousand one major event. Yeah, so at that time there was uh, buzz that disclosure was any time within a few years of then. So, what would be the difference now of you saying that you believe disclosure is in months, not years? And the second part of the question would be, why would the government not? Be disclosing this because at years ago they had the uh well it would frighten the people and the humanity wouldn't know how to react to it i think that's bullshit i don't believe that is the reason they held it back um well, i think that was kind of the part of but uh, the situation in may of 2001 was interesting mm -hmm. uh, the cold war was over right uh and been over for almost 10 years the and the cold war was the i think the number one national security basis yeah. on which those within, you know, good people within our defense department and, and services that look, we're, we're, we're always a few hours away from annihilation. All it takes is one mistake. A missile gets launched or a miscalculation uh, of a first strike is going to work for us or whatever the hell. And a couple of hours later, you, you, you really don't want to be alive. I mean, you just don't want to be alive, okay? All those apocalyptic scenarios that we see in all these movies we, we just cannot have enough of, and all these streaming television shows like, uh, uh, the, you know, The Walking Dead, I think there's been, what, 260 of those in various uh, uh, formats, different shows, but same thing, connected mm -hmm. to each other. This is the, the, the human race sort of dealing with the fact that for 70 some years now, they have been living on the edge of that. Okay. And so if we have a full out nuclear war, the stuff that you're seeing in those programs, it's worse, going to be worse than that. Yeah. All right. Okay. Those are just, those zombies uh, walking around are just symbols of how would you say the challenges of a apocalyptic world, right? Uh, and while the idea of nuclear war has turned up in a number of these, such as the, the Mad Max series and in, in Walking Dead, Again, the reality will be worse. And so we've been living on the edge of that since 1940s. And so I, I don't no, no one should be shocked, bitter, or, or upset that the, the, those that are in charge of our protection, national security, felt that the disclosure event, that, that revealing that, yes, you're not alone in, in, in this universe, was not something that they could do and feel comfortable that with the results of that or the consequences of that would not have an unintended impact on the uh, nuclear standoff, right? The Cold mm -hmm. War and, and result in an accident or a mistake. They just, it was just too big uh, of a variable to, 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 uh, to, to game out ahead of time, right? And who wants to take that chance? There's a whole list of things that governments would not do during this 70 some year period mm -hmm. uh, of the, the era of mutual assured destruction, which is continuing right now. There's a whole list of things that they don't want to do. And to give you a perfect example, you, you have a situation where 
the Russians, because things are getting a little tense over there, decided to screw with one of our drones. I'll, I'll assume it was over international wa waters. It probably was. Mm -hmm. So they dumped some fuel on it, and they bumped it a little bit, and uh, the propeller was damaged, and the thing crashes into the Black Sea. This mm -hmm. is massive. This is huge news. It's everywhere. And you've got the national security guys coming on and talking about it and the implications and this and that and calling in the ambassador and blah, blah, blah. This is over dumping some fuel on a and, and maybe bumping a drone. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you're not supposed to do that in the, during this, what I call Cold War II. You can't bump drones. And so the people inside the government are contemplating uh, – should we announce there's an extraterrestrial presence, confirm it, and bring the evidence out? Mm -hmm. You think that's not a little bit more difficult to project than bumping a drone? Yeah, it is. And so that is the reason. But regardless of what the potential implications of that are for our, how would you say, risk of nuclear war, mm -hmm. the fact that hundreds of millions of people around the world, perhaps actually based on the polling, billions of people in, in, on, in this world are quite attuned to the fact that we're probably not alone mm -hmm. and and the majority want to know that's been shown in the polls so when you got a couple of billion people that kind of know that this that the uh, the policy is is they know the truth they basically know there's a truth here mm -hmm. at some point it it's actually more damaging to continue to maintain that embargo than it is to end it and I, and I believe that a case can be made intellectually that ending the truth embargo may be just the ticket we need to get out from under this mutual assured destruction mode that we have been in for one full lifetime. And so if that intellectual case prevails in the Congress and the, and the DOD, which I believe it is, then we will certainly get disclosure because, frankly, they don't have an answer. There is nobody in the Department of Defense or in the State Department or anywhere in the intellectual matrix that is part of our United States government is able to walk in front of a camera tomorrow and give a cogent explanation of how the hell we're going to get out from under mutualist or destruction and bring our nuclear weapons down to basically zero or maybe just enough to deal with some particular thing, right? No one. Don't, they don't even try. And so the idea that disclosure... And the confirmation that there's an extraterrestrial presence leading to who knows what, but I believe open contact. If that offers a way out, I think some people inside the DOD and in, in, our, in our Congress are starting to think, yeah, that may be the only way out. And that's the kind of stuff I talk about. And I, I'm hoping that CNN, MSNBC, Fox, and some of these other news organizations will maybe pay attention because no one is going on these shows and talking this way. They're just not bringing this up. They're staying within a fairly narrow band because they don't want to, they want to be asked back, right? Meaning, you know, well, that's... if I far, if I say this is too aggressive, I won't be asked back. I don't, I don't, I'm not concerned about that. This message needs to get out there. Also, the message needs to get out exactly what the hell's going on here. People think that there's a lot of people out there, I don't blame them, who think that the reason this program has been set up with the DOD, the reason these members of Congress are, are putting in legislation, is that they just figured out there's a phenomenon. Oh, my God, we don't know what it is, and we probably should deal with that. Hmm. No, that's not it at all. There are people inside Congress, people actually who are sitting members, people who are on the staff, and people within the Pentagon, within the Air Force, the Navy, the D CIA, you name the agency, there are people in there that know full well that the United States government has known about the ET presence since 47, latest, mm -hmm. and has been researching, engaging, tracking it for every single day for the last 75 years. They know that. And so, well, then what is happening? What is happening is what I call a public relations-driven extrication process, pro pro project or process mm -hmm. in which all the right things are being done that should have, could have been done in 47, 53, 93, 94, but we're not, in order to set the stage for a head of state, the president, to confirm the ET presence and do it in a way that is responsible, the public participates, the DOD participates, the Congress participates, and it's it's pretty much uh, transparent, the setting of, of creating a, 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 a way for the, the president to come forward and make that confirmation with minimum disruption. That is what's going on. They're, they're trying to end the truth embargo, right? 
not mm -hmm. go finally figure out what this phenomenon is. And that is that is that is generating a lot of cognitive dissonance because a lot of people are going, I, I don't I don't get it. Why why are you acting like there was no evidence going back? Why are you acting like everything we we everything that came out and we learned about going back to forty seven didn't happen? It what why aren't you just coming forward and telling us? I understand that cognitive dissonance. I want to help, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're a journalist or an academic or just a regular American or Canadian, I want to help. This is a process to serve the disclosure event, to make it as comfortable and as participatory and it hopefully is a nonpartisan. And if you look at the actions of the members of Congress, if you look at the way the DOD is dealing with this, you will see that's exactly what is happening. And I'm perfectly comfortable with it. I wish it was going faster, mm -hmm. but a worldwide pandemic infecting billions of people and killing tens of millions. Yeah, that's kind of a disruptor as well as a, a probably a higher level of political dysfunction in the United States, which always has political dysfunction. But at times, it gets worse. Well, it's worse. And so I appreciate that. If things, if there had been no pandemic, if there had been a more stable situation politically in the United States, I think we would have had disclosure three or four years ago. Perfect. Well, I think we can leave it here. I think uh, my viewers are um, definitely going to be interested in watching this interview. Uh, before I forget, what's the opposite of unsubscribe? Subscribe, yeah. Uh, you can the chat. To, uh, my updates, uh, PRG updates, free on my website, paradigmresearchgroup.org. Yeah. Please follow me on Twitter, Steve, at Steve Bassett or Paradigm Research Group. Uh, Paradigm Research Group has a Facebook page. Yep. I've got a personal page, which is really an activist page, but I've only got about 18 slots left, but give it a shot. Uh, uh, I'm trying to build a social media presence, uh, increase my social media presence because PRG has got a pretty big announcement coming uh, about a couple of things wow. that have been in the works for two years, which in, in, in out Los Angeles is referred to as development hell. And uh, I have certainly learned that that is the correct name for it, development hell. But again, if you stick with it, ultimately hell ends and production begins. So uh, I, I'm looking to build my social media presence. Please follow, please subscribe, because there's going to be some interesting things coming. And I want to be able to convey that to as many people as possible. Perfect. I'll put all the links down below um, in the description box when I upload this uh, interview, which should be in the next 24 hours. Uh, once again, Steve, I thank you and uh, like to have you back on the show after, uh, let's say, the middle of the summer after uh, the conference in Vegas. I predict you're going to call me before then, but I'll tell you what, any time, my friend, uh, I believe the podcast world, the broadcast world that has become almost uh, democratized, mm -hmm. almost anyone can do competent stuff, uh, is a major factor in what's going on. And so I am a friend of the podcast world. They call me, I go on camera. Perfect. <clears throat> Just like uh, I think it was Bell Canada had a commercial, little things mean a lot, right? Sure. Absolutely. All right. Take care, Steve. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.